So in terms of the volume one changes, these are the changes we're going to touch on this afternoon. And first is around those governing requirements again, and we're not going to go over old ground with some of this stuff, but there's been a lot of changes to those governing requirements, a lot of changes to the performance solutions area of the code. Also about, there's been changes to the reference documents. I'm not, um, what we'll talk about just is those reference documents that are applicable to volume one, which I didn't mention this morning. The product documentation requirements are there. And here's probably getting into the meat of it is really those, one of the biggest changes to the code in the best part of the last 15 to 20 years in terms of it now being mandatory for sprinkler protection for buildings four storeys and above for class two and class three buildings. The introduction of the condensation management provisions. The section J energy efficiency increases that many of you will be aware of in terms of those significant stringency increases. And really with a lot of these buildings now, whilst I'll talk about class two buildings, many of us will know that mixed use buildings now are really common. Um, it's very rare now that you really just see a, a, a homogenous class two building. A lot of the time it's got a ground floor, an underground car park or three levels of car park. Then you have the, and might have ground floor offices and shops and then followed by apartments above and maybe even a rooftop bar. So the provisions are quite complex now more and more and those energy efficiency provisions whilst they say that they apply to commercial buildings they will significantly affect those mixed use buildings common areas of buildings and also the shared services for those buildings as as we've been talking about in many ch code changes in the last few years about fire safety and cladding changes there's been some more changes there one of those is includes the retention of the bonded laminates clause um, permitting sarking as a deemed to satisfy solution under limited un, for specific products. Um, there's also the class two energy efficiency changes similar to those that um, came in for, for how. So I'll go in a bit more detail and those sprinkler stuff I will talk in a bit more detail to give you some more information about it. Um, the governing requirements changes, we talked about a fair bit of detail that this morning. So. I'll just note out a few things for you. There's a lot of new definitions being incorporated into the code. They are listed in your summary of changes document there. A lot of the changes for the definitions in particular around the introduction of the new fire safety verification method. Also about the section J energy efficiency changes. There's also a number of changes from the condensation provisions as well. So there's a lot of new definitions incorporated into the code. And here's just a snapshot on, on the screen itself. Similarly, with the reference documents, there's quite a few new standards referenced in there that I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on them because you really won't, you know, until you're actually dealing with them on a day-to-day -day basis. But there is quite a few in there and quite a few changes. Again, they're listed in your summary of reference document changes if you're using them, you know, around 1670 for your smoke, smoke detection systems. 1668 in your, um, there's been some changes there for some of the ventilation building standards. And there's a lot of new standards being incorporated as part of the section J provisions as well. So this morning I talked about the code being a performance based code and I wouldn't need to reiterate that for people in the room. But I mentioned about the Australian Building Codes Board is doing a lot of work on the quantification of performance. And a lot of those new change, changes around some of the changes to the performance requirement and a lot of those new verification methods. And I think a lot of those verification methods really are more applicable in a class two to nine sense than a class one scenario. One of the ones I mentioned is about the room height or spaces performance requirement. And you'll notice in the performance requirement, there's no mention of 2.4. That's a deemed to satisfy requirement. The performance requirement talks about sufficient height that does not unduly interfere with the intended function of the room or the space. Then you've got a verification method that's now been incorporated to look at what that room is being used for, what is going to be, you know, the activity support level, what will be, um, you know, really what is that use and what would be impinged on if it was to have a lower room height for that space. And I think for a class two to nine building, this will become much more relevant in its use for maybe like a loft bedroom in, a, in, an, in an apartment. Also about, I've seen this used already for, for plant rooms and reduced ceiling heights for plant rooms. And when you do that aggregated over a class two building, which could be 
50, 60 stories, this is where it has more relevance and application than, than say, the home theatre room in the house when, you know, but that could be used for a home theatre room where the predominant function of that space is going to be people there sitting down watching movies. So would that reduced ceiling height really impinge on the activity levels of that room itself? Another verification method that's been incorporated into the code is around overflow protection. And this is a verification method that has come from South Australia. They've been using this for quite a while. And what it allows for, instead of having that additional floor waste that you may require in your laundry or your bathroom where it's over, uh, you know, in addition to the one in the shower, where it's over a habitable room below, rather than having that additional floor waste, this allows for each of the individual, you know, fixtures and, and the basins and other things like that to have their own inbuilt overflow and then you therefore wouldn't require to have that additional floor waste. I know I've seen this performance requirement in action myself, I've, I've done one of these. Um, so I think it's, you know, when, again, moving into more and more of these European laundries where you would have been required to have that floor waste in there, you know, where the, the appliances would actually already have the, the you know, all have their inbuilt overflows, this is an appropriate performance solution that you could do and really makes it a simplified process. For those in your room, have you seen this one done already? Have you had to approve one or design it yourself or construct it? Yeah, a few nods. Yeah, certainly I've seen it quite a bit across the country already. So I think it's we've sort of one of those ones we thought was a really good one to incorporate into the code. <coughs> 